Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kimes. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe on our website at thetwotestaments.com, where you can find our library of episodes and donate to support our work. Follow us also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through Scripture. I'm Will Kynes. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. In this episode, we'd like to introduce you to the book of Revelation, and we have with us Dr. Jamie Davis, who is going to guide and orient us to our journey through Revelation this season. Uh, Dr. Davis is Director of Postgraduate Research uh, and Tutor in New Testament at Trinity College, Bristol. Uh, Thanks for joining us, Jamie. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Wells. Good to see you. Uh, Jamie is the author of a number of uh, really important books and fascinating books and relevant books on Revelation. Uh, He's just coming off, about to come off, probably will have come off hot off the press by the time this episode (laughs) releases, uh, is Reading Revelation, a Literary and Theological Commentary. Um, which is coming out with Smith and Helwes. Um, He's also the author of The Apocalyptic Paul, uh, which came out with Cascade in 2022, and uh, his book, Paul Among the Apocalypses, an evaluation of the apocalyptic Paul in the context of Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature, uh, which came out with the Library of New Testament Studies uh, series uh, with TNT Clark. And that book is fascinating for comparing Paul Uh, with other Jewish and Christian apocalyptic texts like the book of Revelation, which is really fascinating, I think, entree into Paul. So, Jamie, the first question I'd like to ask you uh, is, how did you get into Revelation? I mean, of all the books in the Bible that you could focus your efforts on, this is, a let's say, an interesting choice. Yeah, it was was an interesting story, actually. Although my first two books were on Paul, or have Paul in the title at least, um, I I tried to avoid Paul. I didn't really want, I'm an accidental Paul scholar. I I kind of um, set out to to do other things. And it was Revelation that really got my attention early on in my graduate study. So I was doing a, um, a master's program at the University of St. Andrews. And there was a, a class in that program taught by Grant McCaskill on the book of Revelation and particularly relating it to the contemporary world. And anyone who knows anything about Revelation knows that how you relate it to the contemporary world is, of course, one of the big sticky questions. And the way in which um, Dr. McCaskill went about teaching that course just really um, got my attention. It was really exciting. It was my first one of my first classes at master's level doing theology. And I just really fell in love with it for all sorts of reasons. The way it, it captures the imagination as a book, some of the complex questions of how it, it shapes the Christian imagination in relation to the contemporary world, particularly um, its politics, its relatedness to the to its ancient world and to the contemporary world. All of those things got my attention. So I I enjoyed that class. I performed reasonably well in it. I wrote my master's dissertation with Grant McCaskill on Revelation. And following on for that, um, started working with him um, on what was going to be a doctorate on Revelation's political theology. And um, kind of accidentally became the book that Ronnie just mentioned, which actually reads Paul in relation to Revelation. So um, I kind of got swallowed by the black hole of Pauline studies for a few years thereafter. But my, my interest in Revelation persists and hence the, hence the commentaries. Not everybody's cup of tea to start with Revelation as their first ever commentary, but that's where I seem to have begun. So, um, yeah, I, I've been fascinated by it ever since. Now, were you able to maintain your political interests uh, as you took this kind of left turn into Paul? Was is that still a major theme of your research? Uh, not not in the um, not in the text, but it's there between the lines for people who know what's going on. There's there's definitely a lot about um, apocalyptic thought generally, um, Second Temple Jewish and Christian apocalyptic thought, and the literature that springs from from that um, way of thinking. There's a lot about that that has really interesting connections with um, how how believers and how how Jewish and Christian communities understand themselves in relation to power, in relation to empire, in relation to to all sorts of other political questions. So, yeah, that's still something that's very interesting to me. I still try and keep my hand in with understanding some of that stuff. I don't think I've published that much on the political side of it. Um, I kind of moved on to other things, but it's still there. And I still think it's very, very important for understanding um, how we read these texts. Yeah, I do feel like that the best way to be a scholar of Paul is to be an accidental 
Pauline Scholar because it's also safer because if you like miss something important you can so you can just say hey I'm just an accidental <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm not I keep trying to play that um, card I don't know the more the years go by the more I think I can't play that one anymore <laughs> <laughs> the less you can. <laughs> All right. Well, um, what have you personally found most difficult or challenging about interpreting the book of Revelation? Yeah, I mean, that's there's a long list of, of very difficult and challenging things. I think sitting down to try and write a commentary, I think the hardest part for me was trying to work out the structure of the book. Um, there seem to be as many proposals for the structure as there are commentators, and um, all of them have got merit. In places, all of them have got problems in other places. It, I think, probably more than arguably any other book of the Bible, certainly any any other book of the New Testament, it, it resists kind of clear outlines. And pretty much any commentator you read will apologise for their outline and say, "This is the best I could manage," and um, there are problems with it, but we have to move on. So I don't think anybody feels like they've absolutely slam dunk found the found the structure of the book, which gives me some comfort because I ended up abandoning and pretty much saying this is the best I can do. Um, it's just so complex. Um, <laughs> not the normal structural features that you look for when you're looking at any book of the New Testament um, don't line up quite as neatly with Revelation. So that probably got me got me the most confused. I had to go for lots of long walks when I was trying to work that stuff out. And I think the other thing was the, the weight of contemporary reception of the book just being aware of how misused it's been, how easily co-opted it can be for all sorts of agendas, um, how how many different approaches to reading there have been um, down through the centuries, and particularly in the modern era, and feeling that that weight of, of kind of the hermeneutical positions, and sometimes you've got to really back up, especially when you're talking to a student, you know, who, who may have come from a different different perspective to you. You've got to really back up and say, okay, what are the assumptions we're making when we start to read a text like this? And I find myself constantly going back through that stuff as I read and trying to retrace my steps a little bit. How did I get to reading it this way? And do I need to keep checking that I've not gone off down a dead dead end and that kind of thing? So, yeah, it's it's a tough read. It's not the easiest place to begin if you're going to be a, a biblical commentator. But, you know, the, the invitation came through. And so I said yes and then regretted saying yes, kind of like with this podcast, really. <laughs> 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 yeah well <laughs> we're gonna see how much you we can get you to regret saying yes to this podcast because we are going to ask you a lot of those difficult kind of questions uh, the goal here is actually to provide our listeners with something a little bit like the introduction to a commentary which you've just written so you should be well prepared to do to think about those kinds of um, behind the text questions those historical questions those the text itself questions, literary types of questions, and then the in front of the text questions, questions of reception and so forth. And you've already yeah. raised a few of those um, and pointed out how difficult they are with Revelation. But let's start with behind the text. Let's start with the historical context of the book. What do we know about when and where Revelation was written? Well, no is a strong word. Uh, what can we say with some confidence? Uh, usually the, the two options on the table um, that scholars repeatedly debate are, um, well, cer certainly we can say it's pretty pretty certainly late first century. So that gives us a kind of a ballpark. Um, a lot of the debate comes down to whether it was written in the very late 60s under the reign of Emperor Nero or whether it was written um, in the 90s under Domitian. And there's all sorts of different um, arguments that go in either direction. And you'll in your commentaries, you'll see people kind of weighing that that evidence and coming down usually usually on one of those two two dates so either just before the fall of the temple in AD 70 kind of between 68 and 70 um, or late 90s um, under under the emperor Domitian um, usually the evidence that gets cited uh, are things like uh, chapter 17 where there's a, the list of the seven kings of whom five have fallen one is living and one has not yet come um, so there's a clear reference there to a list of seven kings. And if you've got a list of seven kings, likelihood is that's talking about Roman emperors. Now you've got some kind of um, anchors. At least you think you've got some anchors uh, for the history. But of course, it doesn't tell you where to start counting. And so figuring out which one is uh, is the living one, this number six that's living, and which one has not yet come, uh, will depend on where you start counting. And so they, you end up with... Um, 
not only differences in in how you count who you begin with. Do you begin with Julius? Do you begin with Octavian? You know, where do you start? Um, who do you include? Do you include um, all of the emperors in that very tumultuous year of 68, 69, when Rome had four different emperors in, in the space of a calendar year? Once you start digging into it, you find there are something like nine different ways of counting that. Oppress- so that, that clear evidence turns out to be quite <laughs> tricky. And often the arguments become circular pretty quickly. Um, you can make the number land where you want it to, depending on where you start counting. But there's other things, thankfully, as well, that we can work on. Things like um, veiled references to Nero in the Mark of the Beast, for example. Um, imagery that seems to speak about Nero's, the mythology that surrounded the Emperor Nero and this kind of thing. So he's clearly an important figure. Whether that means it was written under his reign or whether it's the memory of his reign, of course, then becomes another question. Um, I'm I'm left with a little bit of a... A fence sitting. Thankfully, the commentary I wrote was a literary commentary, so I was dealing with final form, not spending quite as much time on historical critical questions as others do, um, which might feel like a bit of a dodge, but it allowed me to kind of remain somewhat agnostic. Um, The other thing to mention is there are quite a few proposals for um, the possibility that this text went through a, a process of compilation or revision or possibly even had two editions and could have had a first edition in the 60s and then a revised its second edition, either by a different hand or by or by uh, by um, John uh, later in, in the late first century. So that that just complexifies things even further. Um, there you go. Does that help? <laughs> Jamie, how about how about where it was written? Do you have a sense of uh, where you land on that or what some I mean, of the Thankfully, that, one, that one's a lot more straightforward because John just tells us in the text he was on the island called Patmos, which still exists and we can you can go there. Um, you could possibly even visit the cave where um, church tradition says it was written. So that's that one's a lot easier to nail down. Um, from Patmos, okay. for some reason, um, because of the word of the Lord, whether that means exile, whether that means a, a retreat in order to hear the word of the Lord, whether that means something else is debated, but... Yeah, John was on was on Patmos when he wrote this, and he wrote it to uh, the seven churches in in um, what we now know of as Western Turkey, um, Asia Minor, which are real places that are that are named. So we've got a lot more to go on when it comes to the geography. Great. Um, now, we tell us a little bit about authorship and audience. So, who wrote this text? What do we know about this John or uh, whoever wrote it? And what do we know about their perhaps ethnic, religious identity, as well as that of the audience? Well, we know his name's John, um, which uh, might might seem pretty straightforward, but again, <laughs> it's debated. Where the big question, of course, is, is this the same John that wrote the gospel and, and the letters of John? And that's, right. um, that's pretty, that's been debated for a very, very long time. Um, there's linguistic evidence that suggests this is a different John. There seems to be certainly different kinds of language going on. Um, Certain key vocabulary, key ideas seem to be different. I'm of the thought that that's not as compelling an argument as is sometimes taken. Um, I don't know why uh, an author has to write using exactly the same vocabulary over the span of 20, 30 years. I certainly don't use the same vocabulary I did 10 years ago. Um, There's no reason why, why John should, especially as he moves from writing in three different kinds of writing. You know, you're writing an apocalypse, whatever this is. It's certainly something different to the to a gospel. Um, so I don't see that it's that strong of an argument to point out differences in vocabulary and so on. I think that's that's certainly within the possibility of being the same person. That said, there are other reasons why people um, might not be convinced that it's the same John, and it's been debated for as long as Revelation's been considered uh, canonically. So, um, yeah, who who he was? He seems to be known as a prophet within the church. Um, he's not writing under a pseudonym, which sometimes happens with these kinds of these kinds of documents. Um, he seems to be personally known as someone who operates in prophetic ministry within the church, and uh, is known to them. He seems to be using his own his own name, as far as we can tell. Um, so um, that's about as far as we can we can go on that. A lot of people will say John of Patmos or John the Seer as a way of distinguishing him from from John the Evangelist. Um, so that's sometimes helpful to do. Again, it, it really depends on how much you want to read Revelation 
in isolation from the rest of the canon and and to what degree you want to read it canonically i i lean towards reading it canonically in any case so i'm again happy to remain somewhat agnostic although i do lean slightly towards um it being the same john as wrote the uh, the gospels and letters which i'm not sure is that much of a dominant position these days as it once was um i think most people would say it's a, it's a different author um in terms of his audience um yeah these these uh, seven churches that are named um, which are churches in in kind of uh, Asia Minor, um, interesting in, in as a list because they're not the most obvious and important seven churches. There are some some significant omissions in the area. Colossi, for example, isn't isn't named. Um, churches in Miletus and Troas and these kinds of places that were important um, Christian centres are not listed. And I think that uh, speaks more about the symbolism of of the number seven and the the selection of these particular seven churches as a way of saying something more than just addressing these seven communities and i think i think it's uh, both is there's a lot of both ands when it comes to this kind of imagery it both addresses these seven communities as historical communities in in asia minor but also by addressing them as seven uh, addresses the church in its in its completeness and so it's i think it's very much intended to be an address to the church um, in, in, in its entirety by way of addressing these seven communities in particular. Uh, what about in terms of the, uh, what you might like the ethnic composition of maybe the audience? Um, are there clues to the text that, uh, they're Gentile or predominantly Gentile or that they're, uh, Jewish, that they're still, you know, in con in contact with, uh, other Jews who may not, you know, confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, how do you kind of make sense of that piece? Especially, you know, yeah. there's the, as you know, there's this whole swath of uh, reading these New Testament texts as Jewish literature. Yeah. Um, so how how does that work with the let's say the identity of the author, but also the identity of the of the audience? Are they predominantly Jews, or how does that work? Yeah, of course, there's a lot of um, careful. Um, navigating we've got to do with our language when we're talking about the late first century um we're not dealing of a, a, at a time when there's the, the same kinds of clear religious distinctions that we might make today and so we have to be careful not to be anachronistic here certainly the audience are expected to know their old testament the hebrew bible uh, the number of allusions to the hebrew scriptures um in the book of revelation is variously counted but it's very very high and you scarcely get past a paragraph without I don't think you can understand it at all without a deep knowledge uh, of what Christians call the Old Testament of the, Jew the Jewish scriptures. Um, I don't think you can make very good progress without that kind of, not just um, concordance knowledge, but a deep um, living knowledge of those scriptures. And so for that reason, I think it would be, um, it'd be a fair assumption that there's, a, there's certainly a strong Jewish contingent involved um, in the audiences. Um, that said, these are communities where there were people from all over. You know, we're not we're in the diaspora here. We're not in um, in Israel Palestine. So, we've got um, a situation where there's likely to be, I think there's likely to be mixed communities of um, of people from various different places, and um, I think some of that is reflected, particularly in some of the Greco-Roman imagery that comes in, um, and some of the Hellenistic imagery that comes in. But of course, at that time, there's not a clear separation between Greek and Jew in terms of um, culture, because Jews at that time were Hellenistic Jews and knew this stuff as well. So mm -hmm. uh, the degree to which we can tease these apart, I think, says more about um, our understanding of ethnicities than it does about the kind of the historical situation. But I, I take them to be mixed communities of Jew and Gentile, and um, certainly an expectation that many, if not most, of the audience would know these Hebrew scriptures, particularly the prophets and the Psalms, very, very well indeed. And uh, that's I think quite self-consciously the tradition in which John sees himself writing. So we've talked about the author and we've talked about the audience. Now let's talk about the connection between them. Why is mm -hmm. John writing to this group of people? What purpose is the book intended to serve? It's nothing. I want to say two things. First is that the, a fairly um, well-known one that, um, Right at the beginning, in 1-1, in one, one, um, John writes, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So there's clearly 
some connection to um, a prophecy about something that is soon to take place. Now, of course, that takes us straight into what do we mean by soon and how does this book relate to um, to future events? I'm sure we'll get into that in a few minutes. But there's a degree to which the purpose of the book is is a revelation. It's an unveiling of things soon to happen. Um, but if you keep on reading, as you go right through the first few chapters, there's these repeated refrains in the messages to the seven churches that um, what is happening here in this book is designed to equip them for lives of, of faithful witness, um, of bearing witness to Christ in their situations under various kinds of difficulty, various kinds of compromise. You, you read through the seven messages to the churches, you see quite a variety of uh, encouragement and rebuke. Um and but the, the uniting theme that runs through them all is that this um, this is a call for the church to listen to what the spirit has to say, to equip them for faithful witness, and patient endurance, and a call to conquer. Um, now, what it means to conquer gets some very careful theological unpacking as the book goes through, and it isn't necessarily the kind of um, muscular Christianity some people might uh, expect. Um, Conquering is defined by looking to the Lamb. But that call to, to be con a conquering community, a faithfully witnessing community, following in the footsteps of the Lamb, who is the one who conquers, who is the faithful witness, that that I think is arguably the more dominant purpose for the book, um, connected to the what is to come. But I think we sometimes get these things out of order, and we focus so much on Revelation as a, as a predicted timeline of, of the end, that we miss, I think, a dominant purpose for the book, which is equipping of the saints for lives of witness in, in the present. And I think we do well to kind of redress that balance a little and focus a little more on, on that call to be faithful witnesses that seems to run throughout the book, actually, right through the end. Yeah, and it seems that that call to being a faithful witness is one that uh, means being faithful even to death, right? Because the lamb is the one who's, who slaughtered and is killed. And uh, it, I mean, it seems like that's that's a major motif, right? That the way you conquer in the book of Revelation, the way the saints conquer is by being faithful witnesses, even to the point of their own death. And and some and then there's going to be a future kind of vindication. So, I mean, is that kind of um, a good way to think about it? That in the present, you know, the readers, let's say, are called to uh, mimic the kind of suffering and perseverance uh, and then their hope for a future is a kind of vindication. Is that, is that kind of a, what do you think of that kind of very broad <laughs> and basic sketch? Yeah, I think whenever you see the this repeated call to conquer, I think it's really important that um, that militaristic language is read through the lens of um, the depictions of Christ, that their, that their call to witness and their call to conquer is... Um, in emulation of the the Lamb who of, of Christ who is the witness, the faithful and true witness, as he's called, and how we understand his faithfulness as a witness is seen um, by his laying down of himself uh, as the, in, with the image of the Lamb, and that central image that uh, no doubt you'll spend a good bit of time on in, in chapters four and five, that central vision of Christ. I think is is determinative for how we think about conquering, because the book is full of all sorts of apparently bloodthirsty imagery. There's swords and battles and armies and so on, and um, we have to be very careful with that because what Christians do with imagery of conquest, uh, of warfare, um, matters very much for the communities we live in and how we preach to them, how we how we. Uh, stir up the imagination of what it means to live a victorious Christian life. Um, when I teach this class to, to my to my students here, one of the assignments I often set is to ask them what, what Christian conquest is according to Revelation. What does it mean to live a victorious life? And I think pretty consistently Revelation depicts conquest as, and, and this is not the only image that is upside down, uh, but it depicts conquest as apparent defeat, uh, as apparent um, mm -hmm. failure that the, um, the the slainness of the lamb is what wins him the victory and the 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 witness unto death of of the of the saints is what makes them conquerors and i think that's um that's just one of arguably one of the central ways in which revelation's imagery 
um, kind of transforms the imagination. Vi don't let the world define victory. I'm going to show you what victory really looks like. And by the way, the thing that you think is great and powerful, I'm going to show you that it's small and beaten. So it does it the other way too, um, as a critique of power. So it gives you an, a, an inside out and upside down view of what real victory is, what real um, Christian uh, conquest looks like. And I think we do well when we read this book to remember that whenever we come across imagery that, that seems to be triumphalistic or dominionist, that seems to give license to Christian use of power. I think be careful. we have to be careful not to define power in worldly terms. And that's why this book is so important. It gives us a new set of um, imaginative lenses through which to talk about things like Christian power and, and violence and things like um, conquest and what it means to live successful, powerful lives when redefined according to the vision of the Lamb. And that's the book gives us all sorts of different ways of seeing that. So, yeah, I think the way you put it, Ronnie, was really helpful. Um, this is what we mean um, when we're talking about victory. What we're talking about is self-sacrifice. Great. Now, how important is it or how important was it for you when you're writing your commentary to kind of sort out a lot of these, you know, like behind the text issues, like the authorship, audience, you know, geography, location and all that historical context, time. Uh, how important was that? For you, were there some of those issues were more important than others in terms of interpreting uh, the text, or where did where did you come down on that? Yeah, I, I was fairly eclectic on this. Um, sometimes I felt like I was just picking the times when I could say some things with confidence and avoiding the ones when I couldn't. But I, it, the, my approach in the commentary was a literary and theological one, so I was largely concerned with the final form of the text as we have it. Um, in as much as we can reconstruct anything called final form, but you know what I mean. The, ba the basic sense of uh, Revelation as we have it, mm -hmm. it's, it's narrative, it's shape, it's imagery, it's characters. These kind of literary concerns were, were for me the more important ones. But you can't cut that away completely from history. And so there were some historical questions that had purchase on how I read various things. Um, for example, I've already mentioned um, the way it connects to questions of power in the Roman Empire in the first century. Um, many of the images of this book simply don't make any sense if you don't understand um, first century Rome and the things it said about itself and its claims to power that it made about itself. The, the difference for me is whether that is where you stop. So seeing those historical connections doesn't exhaust the meaning of the imagery. Um, I think you go beyond that not around it, but beyond it, through it and beyond it, to say more than historical stuff. So this is where it gets into some of the, the, the things I mentioned about the contemporary reception of the book and the various schools of thought. Um, there are some that would say that that historical reading, what's sometimes called a preterist reading, where um, everything we see here can be explained within the world of the first century. I think that sells short on how the, the imagery and the theology of the book work. I think that it's intended to go beyond that it, that historical connection, not to minimise how important that historical work is. And I do a bit of that in the commentary, but um, and not the only one, of course, there are far better commentaries on the historical side of things. But um, we can make the opposite mistake, which is to, to restrict the meaning to the first, to first century Asia Minor. And I don't think that was John's intention. I think... It, one of the ways that the imagery works is it it pours out beyond those historical references and can continue to have purchase in our world. Um, so one of the great things about the book of Revelation is it's it's not prose. It's not kind of flat didactic um, in as much as anything is, but it's it's not just simple statements. It, this imagery, um, it's this kind of wonderful visual and auditory and sensory experience that you don't get to this degree elsewhere in the in the New Testament, that imagery has a way of changing not just what we think, but how we think, how we imagine. And it, and I think that's one of the things that, that Revelation can do. And it, that's why it, it makes me quite sad when people treat the imagery like a code. Um, you get all these books about, um, you know, websites that crack the code of the apocalypse. This equals this, this equals this. And now that we've now that we've explained all the images, we can dispense with the imagery as if it didn't really matter for the meaning because we've now got the real thing, which are the statements and the facts. And I just think that's such a shame. Uh, I think artists sometimes do a better job of interpreting revelation than commentators do, because they can see that imagery is, mm. is essentially multivalent and polyvalent. So to kind of bring that full circle back to your question, um, 
some of that historical work is really, really important for getting how the imagery connects to the first century world, as long as we don't stop there. That's that's where we, we go through that door, but we have to go into the bigger room beyond that door and start talking about well, what that, does that mean? How does that affect my world? How does this continue to speak um, as imagery for the church? How does it continue to call out faithful witness for us? Um, I'm someone who believes it is scripture and continues to speak to the church. And so one of the ways it does that is to is through this imagery. And I don't want to kill the imagery by turning it into a code. So, yeah, that I had to get into some of those um, historical hermeneutical questions, although my concern was more the literary one. Um, you can't shortcut through the history. You, you, have, you have to round the history. You have to go through it and understand it. Um, but yeah, so the, the opposite mistake obviously also happens, which is to completely avoid the history and, and, and have it speak straight um, to the newspaper. And I think that's also led us down some blind alleys with interpretation as well. So it's a tough needle to thread, but uh, um, worthwhile, worthwhile work. Yeah, I, I really like the way that you put it there, that you have to go through the history to understand the text rather than around history. I mean, you could think of the, the historical perspective that we get that opens up the text for us in new ways is kind of like a set of lenses that we put on when we read the text that enable to see, us to see things more clearly. Um, but they shouldn't be blinders that we put on, you know, a set of lenses that have that block us from seeing the world around us as we read the text. We, we want to see the text more clearly through the historical context, but then use that clearer perception to see the world around us more clearly and how the text is speaking into a world beyond that historical context. I thought that was a great way to talk about it. But let's move from behind the text into the text itself uh, with that background in mind. Now, we call this book the Book of Revelation, not the Book of Revelations, even though that's in, often used in common parlance. You know, in the Society of Biblical Literature, we talk about it sometimes on the podcast, you know, all these nerdy Bible people who get together, they actually sell a t-shirt with yeah. Revelations on it and then the S crossed out. <laughs> Which is just the classic kind of pretentious biblical scholar thing to do, wear a t-shirt correcting general understanding of the pronunciation of a word. But so the book of Revelation is... Although he does receive revelations, I, or I mean, is it a revelation, Jamie? Well, I, this predictable answer, it's both, right? I mean, it's 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 called... <laughs> the, the, first, the first line, it, it says the revelation, singular. The, uh, apocalypsis is the Greek word there. Yeah. Um, hence the name um, in some church traditions, up at the Apocalypse of John. It means the same thing. Um, but of course, he keeps saying, and I saw, and I saw, and I saw. So there's plenty of revelations <laughs> within Revelation. I've, I've crossed out more than my fair share of those S's in, in, in uh, student assignments. <laughs> But I don't, you know, I've given up caring. I, I don't mind what you call it <laughs> as long as we talk about how, what it means. <laughs> You don't care enough to wear a t-shirt, correct? Again, uh, right there about, there yeah. are things I care about more. <laughs> I'm not going to buy the t-shirt. <laughs> <Yeah, yeah. laughs> okay. But you've used the term apocalypse. Yeah. Uh, and that's something you've done a lot of research on. So what is an apocalypse and how does it help us to understand the book of Revelation if we understand this idea of apocalypse in the ancient world? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's again, you won't be surprised to, to hear me say it's massively contested. The question, what is an apocalypse, has been debated quite a lot for quite a long time, um, particularly in the last um, in the last kind of generation of scholarship, um, ever since the, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the rise in importance of reading some of this literature from the Second Temple period. So from from the exile to, to the building of the, the Second Temple, those kind of uh, so right around about the time of the building of the Second Temple, right up until its destruction in the late first century, that that period in, in Jewish life and then what, what became um, Christian life was one of, of tremendous production of, of, of literature, among, among other things. And um, a lot of them seem to share a lot of common features. So a lot of it comes down to how you talk about kinds of writing. Um, but to kind of st to start us off, and then this will get into a, into the debate about kinds of writing... Um, there seem to be this cluster of texts that have a lot of similar features um, of um, the kind of uh, angelic guides that give a seer um, disclosures of knowledge concerning the heavenly realms, concerning earth, concerning its past and its future, 
concerning angels and powers and all sorts of other things, often using quite fantastical imagery of various sorts, tours of heaven, um, secrets revealed, and this kind of thing. Uh, there seem to be quite a few of these texts in circulation. Um, we end up calling them apocalypses largely because of the first word of Revelation, which is interesting. Uh, when John wrote Apocalypse of Jesus Christ, I don't think he was saying, hey, guys, I'm starting a new literary genre here and you're going to name it after this. Uh, he, he was making a theological claim that Jesus Christ was revealing something and Jesus Christ was being revealed. He's making a claim about disclosure. But we then have taken that uh, that label apocalypse to apply to uh, this cluster of texts, um, some of which particularly later on may have been conscious that they were part of a tradition, but certainly the earlier ones um, right back to Daniel, for example, uh, the bits of Daniel that we don't read out in Sunday school, which are the bits that I like the most, actually. Um, right back to Daniel uh, and the book of First Enoch and other texts. Um, that, that's the kind of the early beginnings of what, seem, what we, we describe as this genre apocalypse. Um, and at the basic level, it's, it's about disclosure of secrets. It's about the, uh, things being revealed. Um, there's been all sorts of attempts at definition. One of the more influential ones was in the late 70s, early 80s by um, a, um, a group that, that, that sat down at SBL to try and, okay, let's say what, see what we're talking about here. Um, John Collins is often cited as, as the architect of this definition, um, that it's this um, a genre of revelatory literature with a narrative framework in which a revelation is mediated by an otherworldly being to a human recipient, disclosing a transcendent reality, which is both temporal insofar as it envisages eschatological salvation and spatial insofar as it involves another supernatural world. Which is basically saying it's a, an angel shows you hidden mysteries about heaven and earth and its past and its future, which and there's, there's, there's some fine grained work that goes on there, but that's kind of what we're talking about. And it's really helpful to, to see that revelation is not of its own kind. It is, it's part of a broader discourse, not only within the canon with Daniel and certain sections of, uh, of the, the Minor Prophets, particularly, um, certainly resonances with Ezekiel, but also within the New Testament. If you go to, go to Mark 13 and parallels, the Olivet Discourse, sometimes called the Synoptic Apocalypse, you see that Jesus was not um, unfamiliar with this way of talking. He, he used this kind of language. You see it in the book of Acts. You see it, as I've, as I've argued, you see it in Paul. Even though they're not writing exactly the same kind of literature, the language and imagery and way of thinking is very, very similar. So I think it was far more important to early Christianity than is sometimes given, given credit. Um, so, yeah, reading Revelation as part of a broader literary and cultural phenomenon of apocalypticism and apocalyptic writing um, really helps us because we... we we can have some historical and literary guidance for how these texts work and, and how they were read uh, and how we're supposed to interpret them uh, faithfully uh, that can help us to avoid some of the blind alleys and mistakes that are sometimes made when it's treated as something else. And I think um, getting the genre right, getting the kind of literature right, understanding what it is, is one of the biggest things that we can do to help us read this book faithfully. Great. Now, what can we expect as we, in our season through the book of Revelation, can you help point us to what can we expect on this journey? What is the structure? You've already said earlier that there are as many structures as there are commentators of the book of Revelation. Uh, but are there certain kind of structural features of the text? Are there certain anything, any things that are agreed upon among scholars as they try to divvy up the structure? And maybe you could also walk us through what are some of the major theological themes in Revelation and maybe the some of the key interpretive challenges that we'll face along the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, what, before I move into that, one, one thing I forgot to say that I should say is it's important to recognize that although Revelation calls itself an apocalypse, and we just talked a bit about that genre, it also calls itself a, a prophecy. So it's clearly participating in that genre as well, connecting explicitly and implicitly to the prophetic tradition. And it's also a letter. It's, it has in, in verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace and peace to you. So um, whether we see that as a hybrid three-part three genre or whether we view it differently and see it as a text that participates in at least three different conversations, three different clusters of texts, it's complex. And I guess that kind of segues into this question, what can we expect? I, I, 
Uh, I wrote down that we can expect to be confused. I don't know if that's going to be helpful to your listeners, but we will be disorienting. <laughs> it is a disorienting text. I think deliberately so. Um, you're not meant to be able to crack it. I think to a certain extent, it's supposed to leave you feeling a little disoriented. Certainly John felt disoriented. And as it was read to his readers, I'm certain that they felt disoriented. And I don't want to lose that because I think if I encounter the heavenly realms and it makes perfect sense to me, I might be more concerned than anything else. Um, so a certain amount of disorientation is going to be part of your experience as you read through the book of Revelation, not least because the structure is so hard to follow. Um, you, you, you think you know what's going on and then it changes. Suddenly we're somewhere else. John is whisked off to another location or uh, something that was destroyed two chapters ago is now back or something that something is introduced that you haven't had explained to you yet. You get this foreshadowing, you get this, um, these non sequiturs and this disrupting pattern of cause and effect. It's all very confusing. And I think that's part of it, the way it makes meaning that it is not a straightforward, linear, logical text. It moves forward and backward. Um, I, I sometimes liken it to my students. I liken it to Christopher Nolan's movies that, um, that shuffles narratives in and out of order. I saw Oppenheimer recently. Um, I've not yet seen Barbie, but I've seen Oppenheimer. And as I know Nolan's films quite well, and I was, I was fully wondering how he was going to do his non-linear stuff with this story. And sure enough, he did. But the way he shuffles stories in and out of order can be quite disrupting and confusing, but quite satisfying once you know what's going on. And I think Revelation is similar in some ways. It, it's not a straightforward linear narrative. There, there is a story underlying it of God's purposes, his victory, his his um, defeat of evil, his redemption of humanity and of the, of the world um, in Christ and the glorious hope for that world. Certainly that narrative is there underlying it, but the way in which the story is told, the discourse of the story um, is not straightforwardly from A to B. And I don't think should be read as such. And that to me anyway, helps us reckon a little with the the odd um, non-linear way in which Revelation works. It tends to spiral around rather than just moving straightforwardly from A to B to C, like so you might get, um, for example, in a gospel. Um, although even in the gospels, you get flashbacks and foreshadowing, right? Any good narrative critic will tell you that's there. So, um, so you, I think one of the things you can expect is to be disoriented as you read through, um, but embrace that disorientation as part of the fun and part of the way that Revelation helps shape our imaginations as we read. Um, what else? Uh, oh, yeah. So in terms of the ways that, that scholars have approached the well, structure. Well, could you say, when we're talking yeah, about on. structure, Jamie. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you're probably headed in this direction, but when we're talking about structure, I mean, I've heard these theories about you know, you open the seals and then in the seals, there's a certain number of bowls and then the bowls, you know, and so there's this kind of nested structure, kind of like one of those, those cascading. Yeah. Or those dolls where you open it and right. inside there's another one and another yeah. one. Um, but it, it's very complex because there's certain numbers. And so uh, if you could just walk us through, I mean, obviously we don't have time to go through all the different theories on that, but like, how do you think about those kinds of approaches to dealing with structure? Yeah, there, there are clearly some clues for us to work with. We're not completely left all at sea. Um, the, the series of sevens is one of the most obvious ones, that you get the series of, of seven messages to the churches, or seven, seven oracles. Um, you get the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. Some people count um, seven judgments at the end as well. It's clear that they, these are counted out, so it's clear that we're supposed to find them. The interesting question is, how do you read them in relation to one another? Um, do you have the seven seals then being followed by the seven trumpets, being followed by the seven bowls um, chronologically, as if that's a, a progressive narr narrative in some way? Or does one telescope into the other and open out into the next and open out into the next, which is kind of nested but also forward moving? Or um, you get other theories that, that see them as recapitulative, that they go around, that they each look at the same reality from a different perspective, perhaps with intensifying uh, focuses of some sort. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're going around the same material three times rather than one after the other. That's That might sound like a kind of a modern idea, but actually goes right back to the earliest commentary that we have. 
uh, a guy called uh, Victorinus of Petovium, who in his commentary, which dates right back to the mid third century, I think, he he said, "Don't pay too much attention to the order in which you find everything." So that's that's third century advice for reading it. That's not twenty first century <laughs> um, critical scholarship. That's that's very very old advice. So there's a very long tradition of recognizing that these sequences don't necessarily follow on in a in a straightforward way. That there's a, some sense of uh, of cycling through, and that's the position that I've I've basically taken in in my commentary. Some version of this recapitulative idea. Um, there are, of course, other things that frustrate that analysis. Otherwise, I would be able to, you know, cash in and make my millions by saying I've finally cracked the structure of Revelation, which I almost certainly have not. Um, because you do get regular phrases like, after this, I saw. Uh, and so that after this, it's like, well, is that after in terms of your experience, John? Or is that after in terms of what you're telling me about the timeline of the world? Which What kind of after are we talking about here? And then there's other things like, and I saw, and I saw, which seem to be clear markers. Um, four times John tells us he was in the spirit. Um, are those important structural markers that help us break it up? These things all overlap and make it very complex. Um, some people say hopelessly complex, and it's a product of numerous recensions of the book. Other people think deliberately complex, and, and somehow we haven't found it yet. But that basic idea that that you've got this, I, and I agree with you, Will. The the idea of the Russian doll is actually an image I use in the in the commentary. That what you have is as a nested structure, and I actually think it, if you look at it carefully, I think you can relate the different levels of that doll, the different levels of the narrative, to the different locations in which John finds himself. So on one level, it's a message to John on Patmos, on Earth, talking to the seven churches of Asia Minor, on the outer level. But then he also experiences a, an inner experience of, of an ascent to heaven. And then even within that, there's an even smaller, um, which turns out to be bigger, <laughs> realm, which is the, the innermost um, sanctuary of heaven. So I actually think there's, there's this kind of um, celestial geography going on as well that helps us orient the vision to these different places. And once you get into heaven, I mean, what does time mean there anyway? How does that relate to human time? It's You get into interesting theological territory at that point. Jamie, what about the opening and the ending of the book of Revelation? So the opening, we have this, you know, uh, pretty big vision of Christ. At the end of it, we have this, you know, image of a uh, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. We have this epilogue at the end as well. Do those, uh, you know let's say bookends to the book, give us significant clues to what some of the major themes or theological issues that the book is going to unfold throughout? Yeah, I think they certainly do. Um, um, I think we're supposed to relate them. If you, if you look at the way that um, Christ is described in those opening visions, there are a number of features of that description that foreshadow things that we won't find out about until the very, very end of the book. Um, so it, it's one of these books that bears out repeated reading, uh, and I think quite possibly was intended for regular liturgical reading, and that's kind of how it works. But yeah, the the, the bookends, the opening, and the, and the prologue, the prologue and the epilogue do do have literary connections between them. We're supposed to see them connected, and yeah, well, I guess um, fairly simple answer. It, it's to remind us of the importance of it. it's a revelation of Jesus Christ, um, which sounds fairly um, like a Sunday school answer, but um, we forget in we get caught up in the predictions of the end times and what thing relates to what world event that we forget that this is primarily a book that's about revealing Jesus and he he is the beginning and the end of the book right he is he is the one that is revealed it's a revelation from him given to John but it's also a revelation about him and so it's really important that we keep that central as we're reading um, and ask ourselves what is this telling us about him um, that will that is that is a good guide. Whether I'd call him the theme of the book, I mean, he he is the one who is the revealer and the one who is revealed, right? He he is what it's about. Um, but yeah, you get all sorts of other important themes that are that are signaled to us in that that early section, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the one who holds the churches in his hands, um, that assurance that we get that he is the one who holds them as we get into all the material about what it means for them to bear faithful witness as we get into all the material about God's judgment and about the powers that are at work in the world to be assured that he is the one who holds them at the beginning and he is the one who's coming um, in consummation at the end. That's important because that anchors that call to the church 
um, Christologically anchors it in, in Christ. So yeah, that's certainly important. Um, God's reign, of course, is a major important theme. Um, the, the throne vision that you get early on um, is, is so centering and important uh, because we're not dealing with a book of um, cosmic dualism where there's a battle of good and evil and the, and the outcome is in the balance. That is not what we've got. Um, the book of Revelation has plenty to say about the power of evil, but it is not an equal and opposite power to the power of good. Um, we're told from the very beginning that he has conquered and that for all of the for all of the quite terrifying imagery that we get of the powers of evil in the world, they're not portrayed as as this kind of um, cosmic um, balancing act where we're not sure how it's going to end. And so we're, we're told early on that he is the one who has conquered. And that, that's, I think, very, very important for how the assurance works. Um, and that allows the book to take seriously the problem of evil without it degenerating into a kind of um, a kind of cosmic dualism. So those kind of things are important. Um, and I guess other things, so I've talked a bit about the church, a bit about God's reign, a bit about Jesus, and those are probably the three most important things I would say. The other thing, uh, as well as that image of God and Christ and the church, is the way in which Revelation gives us um, imaginative resources to talk about evil, both in its human dimensions and its uh, demonic or satanic dimensions, and often the relationships between those, um, which is very hard for us to talk about. Um, Revelation gives us the imagery um, with the, the 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 dragon and the beast and these kinds of things in the middle of the book uh, to talk about the evil in ways that that are I think quite helpful um, and help us to reflect a little bit about our own complicity sometimes with with evil in the world. Great, um, Jamie. How early did uh, the Book of Revelation find its place in the New Testament canon alongside the other books? And do you yeah, think its it, placement it, at the very end uh, is significant? <laughs> it's it's had a bit of a patchy history <laughs> when it comes to um, being accepted. I mean, it, it has been um, contested from the beginning, but it's uh, one of the last books to be incorporated into the canon. But at the same time, there's some very, very early witnesses. Um, you find it in the, the Muratorian canon. It's listed there. Um, it, it was omitted by some of the church fathers, particularly in the East, but then others um, include it. Um, it was disputed quite hotly again um, at the Reformation. Luther famously was not a fan uh, of the book of Revelation. Calvin wrote a commentary on every book of the New Testament except Revelation. Um, so, you know, I'm, maybe he was just saving it for last. Who knows? But, you know, that, that might suggest that he was unsure what to do with it. So it's had a bit of a, an interesting um, and debated history for various reasons, not all of them good ones. Uh, there's some anti-Judaism that's part of that story that it's important to recognise. Um, why is it last? I think, I mean, if you're going to end the canon, I think the vision of the New Jerusalem and the Amen, come Lord Jesus is a pretty good ending, right? It's it's definitely better than finishing with Mark's gospel. You know, it's <laughs> this, is a good, this is a good way to finish the canon. It makes complete <laughs> sense that you would put Revelation at the end. Um, because of how it finishes, it gives us this vision of the end. Uh, so I think that's probably one of the reasons why it was placed where it was placed. But it was um, it was also at the back because it went along with some of those other slightly more contested books of the New Testament that took their time to to be um, to be fully recognized. So let's move in front of the text. We've already started that with thinking about when Revelation came into the canon, but more broadly. How have people read Revelation throughout the ages? What are some of the main issues that interpreters have struggled with? And yes, I know there are lots of them, but if you could pick out a couple of primary issues in in, in interpretation of Revelation, what would they be? Mm. I think probably one of the, the biggest and most enduring um, challenges for interpretation, that especially if you take the whole of, of Christian interpretive history, it's been the way in which Revelation relates to chronology. How do we relate it to time? Um, is it speaking about um, uh, a timeline for the end? Is it speaking in spiritual terms about eternal truths? Is it speaking particularly for its own time and place or some combination of these? And that that is not a modern problem. That's an old problem. And at different stages of the church's um, history with this text, 
different answers to that question have become popular and, and certainly around certain times in, in church history, often during times of great upheaval, major thinkers have been drawn to particular interpretive traditions to kind of say, well, because this is going on, if we read the Revelation this way, that helps us to see what's really going on. A lot of anti-Catholicism, for example, has been part of some people being drawn back again to the kind of um, timeline approaches um, that Revelation has, has sometimes been read with. So that's probably one of the most enduring ones. Um, I guess along with that, the question of how we handle the imagery. And this is one that you'll you'll continue to cycle around, no doubt, as you go through the book. What do we do with the images? And how do we read imagery anyway? What does it mean to understand an image? And how does this imagery function in relation to our own world? And those questions have, have been enduring and persistent ones. So, Jamie, you've talked about the way that interpreters have wrestled with Revelation throughout history. Are there ways in which Revelation speaks to our situation currently uh, in ways that could be helpful for us, but perhaps even also troubling? Yeah, uh, very much so. I, I think one of them for me that really stands out is, um, and that I've tried to think about a little, is the way in which Revelation depicts human power and the relationship between human power and satanic power, especially in the middle of the book, in Revelation 12, 13, 14, and onwards, right up to 18, 19. And that, that kind of central vision, both of, of Christ's reign, but also of the the unveiling of, of human power in the form of the beast and the whore Babylon and the, 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 the dragon and so on. Because it's it's a really interesting and troubling way of, of seeing the connections between um, satanic, demonic, spiritual power of evil and some of the ways in which human power can be complicit in that and can be co-opted by that. And certainly I think John wanted his readers to discern when the Roman Empire had overstepped and had become idolatrous. And I think the same call applies to the church today, that Revelation gives us um, imaginative resources to think about um, our own um, complicity with evil when our, our approach to human power, whether that's in, in the state or in government or in other ways, um, can become, uh, can make o overly grand claims for itself and can claim the kind of power that only belongs to God. And, and this is not just a question of, of choosing a political party and saying, well, the other ones are the ones doing the overreach and the idolatry, although I think it is good for us to reflect on such matters. Um, but it could also apply to things like market forces, things like um, our own uh, locations of power in the world, whether that's in states or elsewhere. But to ask the question, uh, at what point does the imagery of, of bestial um, overreach apply? Um, one of my favourite commentators on the book of Revelation is a scholar called Richard Borkham, and he he had a very memorable phase when talking about Babylon. And he, he said, I think, something along the lines of, um, anyone who Babylon's cap fits must wear it. And that's that idea that the, the imagery overflows beyond the historical situation. There are contemporary Babylons, and the church is called to notice them, uh, to, to name their idolatry as such. And if necessary, come apart if we reach that state of confession where we have to say, um, this is where we part ways. Great. Jamie, what are um, scholars today uh, doing with the book of Revelation? What are some of the major issues that uh, scholars are grappling with? Maybe some of the uh, you, what you think are the most helpful and influential approaches uh, to reading Revelation? Mm. It's quite a vibrant area of research. There's so much going on. It's hard to keep up with it all, to be honest. Um, the question of the book's relationship to Jewish apocalypticism continues to be an important one. Lots of good work happening on that. Um, we're increasingly seeing um, a growing amount of work with um, liberationist perspectives. I often think that some of the best insights on this book come from um, what we sometimes call the margins, from the voices of the oppressed, seem to, not surprisingly, have got a better handle on this text than maybe some of the voices from positions of power. So there's there's an increasing amount of work there, which is important. Um, the other thing that I've noticed a lot, which is quite interesting, is is an increasing um, 
and careful attending to the violence of the text, um, to taking that seriously uh, and to to looking carefully at it. Um, I think there are ways of reading that violence redemptively, um, or that violent imagery redemptively. That I don't think I've completely tied that all up in a nice, neat pacifist bow. Um, so there are some very good... Um, some very good uh, scholars working on the violence of the Im- and the, the imagery of violence and the actual practices of violence in the book, which is very important for us to be serious about and, and to be honest about and not pretend it's not there. Um, many have rejected the book of Revelation and some have rejected the message of Christ because of the bloodthirsty imagery that seems to be there. And it's very important that we know what to do with it. So that's that's a real challenge and it's one that people are working on. So there's a whole cluster of different things. Um, also, the question of gender. Um John's John's female imagery is is, is tough. It's tough to handle. Uh, there are places where there seem to be really redemptive images of women. Think of Revelation twelve. Think of the the vision of the New Jerusalem. But they do tend to play into the stereotypes, you know, the mother and the bride. Uh, and then there's also the other negative stereotypes uh, of of Jezebel and and the whore Babylon. So there's some very serious. Um, both feminist critique and also um, other kinds of engagement with the the feminine imagery of, of the book of Revelation that I think could bear some very interesting fruit. So that's that's stuff to watch as well. And that obviously connects with some of the liberationist readings in interesting ways. So yeah, it's quite it's quite a vibrant field. There's a lot of good stuff happening in, in Revelation scholarship. I, I keep my hand in as much as I can whenever my poor work allows me time and I try and try and keep up with the stuff that's going on. Well, uh, we have one final question for you and um, just kudos to you for walking through these very difficult questions and and setting a good foundation for the journey that we're going to be taking through Revelation in this season. The final question we have for you, I hope is an easier one, which is, do you have a blurb for us? Uh, You know, something that you could recommend and it could be a book and that's where we see blurbs all the time, but it could be anything else that you've recently discovered that you think our listeners might enjoy uh, anything from like a TV show to a life hack, whatever it might be. Well, I've mentioned a couple of books already in, in our chat, so I'll have a bit of fun with this one. Um, I think uh, readers of the book of revelation would benefit greatly from um, watching some of the films of Christopher Nolan. Um, particularly his early work. So if you if you know the movie Memento, uh, it's one of his early and famous films, oh, yeah. really good film. Um, many more people will know the movie Inception. And those, those, story, those movies both mess with narrative continuity in ways that are really interesting. And um, Inception, of course, spoiler alert, Inception is, has this narrative device of dreams within dreams. And cause and effect and time and all sorts of identity questions, all sorts of things are handled through that narrative device in ways that I think are really instructive for how Revelation should be read. So um, if I was going to recommend one thing, um, apart from the books that I've mentioned, go and watch Memento, go and watch Inception and think a bit about how you can get a story that moves in and out of order. And how that can actually help us to see things that we wouldn't see if we just told it all in order. Because Revelation works a bit like that. It, it shuffles the narrative order in ways that cause us to think again about, about continuity and about um, cause and effect um, when seen from the divine perspective, which I think is what is being revealed uh, in, in this book. So there you go. There's a, there's a blurb. Um, I use it as an example in my classroom. I found it really helpful myself. So. Great. I mean, the ending of Revelation, there's not the end of Revelation. The ending of Inception is one of my favorite and most frustrating endings. You know, does the top or spinner fall down or not, right? You're left <laughs> guessing and orient and being disoriented as to what's happening. Well, thanks, um, thankfully, Revelation like doesn't the leave Revelation. the top. Thankfully, the book of Revelation doesn't leave the top spinning. <laughs> We're told that um, all will be well. That's true. <laughs> That's true, but you may still be left disoriented after reading the book of Revelation and frustrated, not knowing, you know, yep. all the yep. solutions to all the puzzles and the images and what's going on. And if you've enjoyed this introduction to the book of Revelation, thank you, Jamie, for taking us on this uh, orienting tour to this disorienting text. If you, uh, and if you listeners, if you've enjoyed this, um, <laughs> please um, share it with others. Maybe they can... Uh, get further disoriented by the book of Revelation. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jamie. This episode is co-sponsored by Samford University and the Alabama Humanities Alliance, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this episode do not necessarily represent those of the Alabama Humanities Alliance, the National Endowment for the Humanities, or Samford University. Thanks also to the Faculty Success Center and our student assistants for their help with production and promotion.